thank everybody. Thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for attending this evening's session. Um, many of you may recall two prior presentations with respect to um, the subject at hand, which is stormwater and flooding remediation. Um, in the five-year PFM operating and financial uh, report, there was a significant amount of information disclosed. And then last August, uh, a more detailed overview and discussion on one of their key recommendations, which was stormwater management and remediation initiative, which includes the discussion of potential fees and ways to pay for a fairly ambitious undertaking. So um, th this uh, initiative is structured to include not only the board and staff, but there's a stormwater advisory group and I'll ask Allison just to go through the list of names of both residents, businesses it's a, and, and staff and, and involved parties. And then um, we will have a number of public sessions as we move through the process, which right now is probably in about a one third of the exploratory phase has been uh, completed. And my number may or may not be right, Tony and Mike, so if you want to correct the 30, one third or so, that's fine. But Allison, why don't you, I, I think it would help because probably uh, many of the members of the Stormwater Advisory Group are on the call, but I think it would help for people to understand that we were expansive and broad in those who we included in that. So we were getting a wide range of input, opinions um, and issues that we had to consider as part of this process. So just thanks to, for doing that. Sure. Yeah, thanks to all of our, our volunteers who are helping out, us out with this. Um, so on our list, we have um, Brandon Kim, Brian Rissinger, Chris Kuhl, uh, Nathan Crittenden, uh, David Cohen, Derek Baker, uh, Fred Milbert, uh, Aaron Holland, Julie Slavitt, Anna Rappaport, Rhonda Iser, Robert Hislop, Henry Sakawungu, Susan Harris, Tom McHugh, um, Bob Zinkowski and Commissioner <clears throat> So I think what's important in that group is there's a wide range of both disciplines and perspectives. Even some of the participants are people who have come to the township with lots of concerns about the fact that they've been victimized by both local flooding and by flooding that occurred during some significant weather events. So I think it's important that we took our time in trying to determine and broaden the outreach so that we would have a lot of input and go in a lot of directions before we, we move forward. And I think that's important. Um, who has control of the screen, does Tony? Uh, yes, I do. So if we wanna just move into the slides, I'll, I'll open and then we can figure out where to go. So tonight we're gonna try and, and control this to like we have, scheduled from seven to nine. And we wanna uh, go through the backgrounder, introduce you know, why we're doing it, talk some details about the, the con conceptual program and budget, what potential rates would be out there and how those rates would be calculated. So there's a number of options. As part of creating a fee basis, we also have the possibility of incorporating best management practice credits for whether it's for our commercial properties as well as our residential. And then we'll, uh, at the end of this, we'll have adequate time, we hope, unless some of us like me are long-winded, uh, go beyond the two hour time frame. But the expectation is that we will probably have at least 45 minutes for questions. And, and what we'll do is ask you to write down your questions or concerns throughout the process. There is no bad question. There is nothing that we will either give you an answer for or spend time after the fact researching, contemplating, and then getting back to you or incorporating your question or concern into the things that we ultimately decide. So uh, with that, let's move to the next slide. Thank you, Vanna. Um, <laughs> here's, here's the reality in Cheltenham. Extreme weather events exceed our ability to control stormwater and flooding. And so in both Cheltenham and our neighboring region, there are frequent seasonal weather events. They result in flooding and storm drainage backup or blockage. They really contribute, and many of you on this call have the experience of residential or commercial 
property damage, even township damage. They really create stress and strain on our infrastructure as well as on our trees and greenscape. Um, and, and so these are really things. Um, and in fact, it isn't only the extreme weather events, it's any weather event which basically gets itself into an area where we already have challenges. But those severe weather events really have financial and emotional impact. There's physical damage. It causes shutdowns and evacuations. Some people had to be rescued by, by either um, boat or, or by you know, these, these vehicles that, that went high in the water. There's obviously loss of, of use for any extended periods of time. So we're talking about both the personal and economic losses of time, dollars, an opportunity to, to live in a predictable way. Uh, obviously, those are things that we want to now take a, a, a much more active hand in trying to minimize a, and I would say attempt to eliminate. Um, next. So what are the impact of these events? Well, people frequently lack adequate property and flood insurance. So they you know, experience serious out-of-pocket costs. There's lots of damage claims. And then what you have is a property that has sustained damage and maybe has a history so that when you potentially want to put your property up for um, sale, there are people that are going to be concerned about the incidence of flooding that you've experienced over a period of time. Right now, the township does allocate money and we divert resources into remediating some of these serious problems. Um, but these are events that provoke both frustration, they put demands unnecessary, sometimes demands on the staff. Uh, most times people turn to the township to fix it, hoping that we can take care of the damage or even you know, uh, handle claims. And the truth is that in most cases, FEMA you know, or the Army Corps uh, are not gonna buy up your flooded properties. It's a very rare occurrence you end up feeling exposed and vulnerable. And it's something that we recognize for those of you who have had that experience, including me personally, it's a very difficult thing to have to deal with and accept. And so part of what we're doing here is to do everything we can to reduce you know, those potential events. Next. Um, some facts, both uh, residential, commercial, and township. We do have an aging infrastructure. Most of you are aware of that. We uh, I, almost a year and uh, close to two years ago, we sold our sewer system, recognizing that we had a potential um, repair bill of seventy to one hundred and twenty million dollars, which would have you know put the township in significant financial risk. We now recognize, as part of you know uh, conveying this the the. Um, sewer system, that we have some stormwater management challenges and issues. They're not as extreme, the cost to, um, to deal with those both immediately and in the intermediate and long term are not gonna be there. Uh, and so here are some of the challenges that we have. We, we have to absorb upstream flooding um, to our downstream properties in Cheltenham from our neighbors. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineer has had a, a plan for putting uh, originally nine and six basins into various places where flooding is a problem. And there is a proposed Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection flood mitigation project um, that has, it's really past the planning stages. It's really to, to a point where we hope it to be an implementation in late 22, I think through 24. Um, stormwater runoff and, uh, and flooding add to both the existing problems and the potential problems and expensive that, that we face as a township and that you face as individuals. Um, on a property basis, there's accumulated debris from both trees and from greenery that go into the stream that block some of the inlets and outlets and our stormwater, they also impact our stormwater management facilities, which create diversion and flow going into places where it's not meant to be. Um, there's mud and silt, uh, particularly from properties where there's a lot of soil displacement and they basically force water into places that we really don't have control over. And unfortunately, some individuals take it upon themselves to do you know, unique uh, almost Rube Goldberg type constructions to try and mitigate the flooding. And what it does 
it actually adds to both their problems and to some of the problems that their neighbors experience when we get some of those severe weather events. And some of us have received videos that are unbelievable about uh, the amount of water that's been diverted by somebody trying to, to mitigate their own flooding and it's going onto a neighbor's property creating havoc. Next. So in this study, and we're in, as I said, we're about a third through, we've done extensive information gathering, much of which will be uh, you know, overviewed tonight. We issued an RFP as a result of recognizing uh, the extent of this problem. And we went through eight different firms um, who have this expertise. And we selected Arcadis, which is a Philadelphia-based engineering firm with a tremendous amount of experience that uh, their partners will talk about it out of the eight, uh, out of the eight competitive pro proposals. But as this township and the staff always do, once we got the Arcadis proposal, we then, after we accepted it, we went into a short period of revision and renegotiation. And the folks from Arcadis won't mind us saying that um, we look to reduce uh, what was an originally, you know, more costly undertaking and bring it more in control with what we thought was a, a reasonable budget. And we would deal with whatever issues came out of that. And I think what you'll see is we've gotten um, better than our reduced money's worth, even to this phase. Uh, as, as we have tried in the earned income tax, um, in the PFM study and uh, discussions about the library, we, this board and this uh, township management believe in transparency. So one of the things we wanted to do and one of the recommendations from Arcadis as well as the other uh, candidates was to have an extensive involvement of, of members of the community, the business community, those who had large properties that maybe are contributing to some of the runoff, um, individuals uh, who, who have had the experience and people who have, uh, you know, some requisite knowledge. We've also uh, had the benefit of the Tukani Tukoni Frankfurt expertise who worries about storm, uh, the storm uh, water and also water quality, which is an important aspect of the sustainability life of this township. So we, we did outreaches and we've had a couple of public meetings um, with the stormwater advisory group and we'll continue to do that. We have residential, commercial and institutional property representatives that are part of the advisory committee to help us and, and put us in the right direction. And then there's an executive group of commissioners and staff that are participating in the regular discussions to hone in on the important direction that we're gonna give to both the advisory group and to this um, uh, you know, resident and business community participation. So the studies through the, the adoption of the remediation recommendations are expected to be completed and we hope ready to go into effect by January, 2022. And I guess Tony and, and the team will talk about uh, whether we're on target with that. <laughs> Next. All right. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Tony Gill from Arcadis and basically uh, just let everybody know, start writing down your questions, start you know, noting the issues and things. There's a lot that we're gonna cover tonight. This is not a one-off where we're gonna do this and it's over. We expect to have any number of both um, public sessions, more stormwater advisory group sessions, and this board will continue to listen until we feel like we've gotten to the right point and made some of the right decisions with your help and input. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Mitch, for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm Tony Dill with Arcadis. Uh, been uh, working with Arcadis for over 25 years now here in the uh, Western Philadelphia suburbs. Um, and we've been engaged to prepare the stormwater management fee study that includes uh, first looking at what is the current scope of services provided by the township with regard to stormwater and, and the budget for those services, and also looking at working with staff to develop where, where should the program be, where do we need to be going forward in the associated budget. We've also evaluate a rate structure for the stormwater program to, to understand how the funding uh, needs to be implemented, including a credit policy. Um, where Mitch touched on, where that's where folks can uh, uh, receive a, a redu reduced bill for certain things maintained on their property. 
We've engaged a stormwater advisory committee and, and have continued meetings that are scheduled in the future. Um, this is our first public uh, meeting uh, under our public outreach and education uh, task. And then if the uh, township decides to adopt a stormwater fee, there's uh, provisions for us to help with the implementation phase of that as well. So I'm gonna move on to some of the basic uh, introductory background information. Well, what is stormwater? I think we all, we all know what stormwater is, but the, the main point of this slide is that it's not sewage. It's not the wastewater. So there's two types of pipes in the ground. Some that just carry stormwater from inlets, you know, that you see on the side of the road and they convey that stormwater out to creeks and rivers. And then there's the wastewater, the sewage that comes from your house, you know, um, and that ends in pipes, which now aqua manages. So we have two different types of uh, networks of uh, infrastructure in the road that we're, we're talking about. So the stormwater specifically, where does it go? Obviously it doesn't end up at a wastewater treatment plant. In, in this case, it ends up in our streams and rivers and ultimately out to the Delaware Bay as it works its way down uh, south. Um, and it also goes into what we call best management practices. That's sort of a term used in the stormwater industry to refer to ponds, detention basins, rain gardens, vegetated swales, things that are designed to capture the stormwater and either filter it or reduce the rate of runoff or to hold it and allow it to infiltrate into the ground, basically to reduce the impacts of uh, stormwater runoff uh, on the environment. Now, things that impact stormwater runoff obviously are, you know, impervious, uh, imperviousness, where we have, you know, natural ground. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, trees and, and wooded areas, uh, grass areas. Those uh, help to capture the stormwater and result in, you know, not a lot of runoff for a typical, you know, moderate rain event. We get a lot of uh, water stored that's evaporated and we're infiltrated into the ground. You know, with development, as you as you can imagine, we start paving things and putting up rooftops. You know, we have a lot of hard surfaces that don't in infiltrate, reduces the opportunity for uh, water to get into the ground and even to evaporate, and we end up with a lot more runoff. This is why when, when stormwater fees in particular are examined that they, the focus is typically on impervious surface because that's really what, what, what triggers a lot of the issues that need to be managed. So in, in Cheltenham, like every other community, when we talk about impervious, you know, that's the, what you would imagine it's the, the rooftops and driveways, you know, in residential neighborhoods, it's the commercial developments, the buildings, parking lots, and, you know, these contribute to increased stormwater runoff as well as degraded stormwater quality. You know, the, 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 we get the runoffs, the oils and things off of uh, parking lots uh, that uh, can negatively impact stormwater quality. So the township has an MS4 system, and that's a term that stands for the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So again, it's uh, separate from the sanitary sewers. There are some communities like Philadelphia that have combined sewers where in some cases they have stormwater and wastewater go into the same pipe and then it's uh, treated down at the wastewater plant. But uh, <clears throat> the scope of this study is looking at the stormwater separate system. And there's, uh, as you can see, over 130,000 feet of storm pipe in the ground. Um, we don't know exactly how many manholes. One of the objectives of the program going forward is to get a better inventory and mapping and uh, in a GIS system of the stormwater system to, to help manage it. Uh, we do know there's 75 outfalls. That's where the stormwater goes through a pipe and then it dumps into a creek or stream. That's called an outfall. Over 2,000 inlets. And then 11 of those best management practices on public property, that's like the ponds or, or rain gardens. And then there's an unknown number of those that are on private property, but we know there's some out there. There's just not, we don't have a detailed accounting of those. So when this infrastructure, you know, starts to age and is not being proactively maintained, which I'd say is, is the norm in the country from what I've seen, you know, stormwater is typically the sort of the, the least uh, attended to utility because it's, you know, easy to ignore. It doesn't really matter when it's not raining. And so, you know, when it, when it rains, that's when our stormwater infrastructure matters. And, and then we, we, we can give it a little more attention at that time. But what we see, you know, is a lot of aging infrastructure, pipes that were built, corrugated metal pipes built decades ago, um, and they're starting to reach the end of their useful life. And you end up seeing things like this sinkhole here that can happen. This is above a stormwater pipe that started to degrade and may have a, a hole in it or may have collapsed. And then you start uh, having these situations that can be potentially dangerous. And they also can occur in the road as well where you get potholes and stuff in the road over these storm pipes. 
you know, the, the, the runoff also creates, you know, higher velocities in our streams and you can start to undermine some of the existing infrastructure and create uh, ad additional uh, sediment runoff and erosion of stream banks. And again, these are all things that need to be managed as part of our stormwater program. I think Allison is gonna, from the township is gonna share a little bit about what the township's been, been doing and, and, and where it's going in terms of projects for stormwater. Sure. Um... So the township is required to, uh, has an increasing number of regulatory requirements um, that causes, a, you know, an increase in our stormwater budgets. Um, some of these requirements are for MS4, as you can see, there's a list of what they call four minimum control measures. Um, and each one of these has a different level of reporting and action that we're required to take. Um, and we have to report to the state each year on these items. Um, they require things, you know, how we handle um, our housekeeping, how we engage the community, um, and a number of different things that, that add costs to how we, how we um, manage our stormwater system. And then recently in 2017, um, we were required to um, submit a five-year pollution reduction plan, which requires a number of projects that help reduce the amount of sedimentation um, and other pollutants in our stormwater systems. And then finally, we've been working with um, the Wissahickon watershed on TMDL or total maximum daily loads of certain pollutants such as phosphorus in our stormwater and water in our watersheds. And eventually we're gonna have to do the same thing for the Tookamie Creek watershed, which makes up about 95, 98% of the township. Um, so these are all costs that we see um, increasing as time goes forward. Uh, next one. So some of the things that we've already been working on um, as we go through and try to meet these requirements um, are some of these projects. And what we try to do is incorporate um, pollution reduction measures into projects that they're already trying to do for the township. Um, and also we try to offset these costs with grants. Um, some of these bigger projects, uh, you know, a grant isn't really gonna cover a lot of that, but at least we can help offset that cost where we can. And eventually we're gonna have more projects than we have grant money to fund them. So Curtis Arboretum is one of those projects we, um, as part of our master plan and in increasing the, um, the event center, we included, increased the number of parking spots by 100 as you can see from this design, we added uh, meadows and rain gardens and pervious parking spaces to help um, offset the additional water flow from this site. Um, and this was funded by a grant through the National um, Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Another project that was also part of the master plan was removing a pipe um, from the bottom pond um, at Curtis Arboretum. And as you can see on kind of the right hand side that we had this big parking space that is so big that we could probably had another row of parking. Um, so, and there was a, a pipe that took the water from the bottom pond in directly into the creek. We were able to remove that, um, make the parking a uh, lot, a lot more normal and add a, a stream and biofiltration system. And we're working with the friends of Curtis Arboretum to also eventually add some more plantings to help further filter the stormwater. Next. Conklin Pool, this was a, another project that we were able to fund through grant money. Also it was a cooperative project with um, TTF, Watershed Partnership uh, at Conklin Pool. I think the last time the pool was open um, and everyone was able to use it, there was a concrete channel um, kind of bisecting the property between the pool and the open space. And this created a you know, fast rushing, gushing um, creek and stormwater, and there was nothing really there to filter the pollutants out. Um, and through this project, we were able to, to take that out, next Tony, um, and create a me meandering stream. Um, this is able to capture 42 acres of, of stormwater and filter it and help slow it down. Um, this is, you know, a natural stream ch channel and there's plantings and, and other things to help help with, with managing the stormwater and, and cleaning it. Next. Allison, I, I think we have to do a tip of the hat to TTF for the work, the initiative and, and 
the guidance that they gave us to help make that happen. So thank you, Julie, and your whole team. It really was, it's a valuable addition to the township. Yes, we, we couldn't do what we do without not only our grants, but also our volunteer and, um, and nonprofit organizations such as TTF and the Friends of Curtis and the Friends of High School Park. Um, so we also have a number of projects that through this process, we've been keeping a running tab of projects and you can see this page and the next page also you know, have a pretty long list of projects that we, we know we would like to have funded to help you know, not only filter the stormwater, but also to manage the stormwater and help um, protect our residents from the damage that it would cause. Um, Before we so go we can... past that, could you go back up to? Mm -hmm. so, so just let me jump in, Allison. Uh, as I tried to paint the picture of, you know, the significant amount of investment um, and mitigation projects that need to be done, one of the things that you need to that you need to look at this slide later on, not now, is to see that we're looking at this across the township. Virtually every neighborhood is experiencing the issues, both in the routine rainfalls that come, you know, with some frequency, as well as the serious weather events. So, if you take a look, um, many of these areas have had long-standing experience and problems that have not been uh, addressed. And as I said in the opening, this board and our current, um, the leadership of our staff uh, really uh, has taken on some of the challenges that you know weren't necessarily dealt with by previous boards because it's the only way to, to maintain and guarantee down the line quality of life. So these projects really cover you know, immediate opportunities that need to be dealt with, uh, intermediate and, and some long-term things. Some are projects that, are, that have outside uh, support, the Army Corps of Engineers and the DEP and the, and the Glenside Flood Control Project. But as you can see, there's flood control issues. We have issues that I mentioned with the aging infrastructure, as did Tony, um, with, with things that have to be you know, dealt with now if we're, if we're not gonna continue to experience the kinds of blockages and the kinds of problems that are gonna create those short-term really disasters for, for some of our residents and businesses. And we have repairs to do. Some of these are, and we'll get into, you know, some of these already are funded, but many of these can't be funded practically off of the existing capital dollars that we have, they're allocated elsewhere. And we have to figure out a way to do these projects in order to bring what is a very, a mostly manageable condition, except for the most serious events under much better control. So next slide, Tom. And again, what you can see is we're not just doing construction projects, there's pollutant reduction plans and there's water quality plans. We're looking at this from the standpoint really holistically. We're not just looking at the physical issues, we're looking at the quality of life issues and things that have both a health and safety implication and things that we believe reflect our commitment as a municipality to sustainability and, and greenscaping in the green environment. So um, as, as we get into you know, some, of the, um, some of the details and how we're gonna go about this, know that this is the first cut of a laundry list of projects that we believe are essential to take on between now and the next 10 years. And that's the only way we're gonna do this is to make a commitment now both to get these things underway and to fund it. So thank you. Okay, Tom. Allison, back to you. Sure. So um, yeah, one of the projects that was listed up there uh, as, a, as far as one of our flood control projects is uh, Glenside. Um, this is a prior completed phase of the project that many of you may already be familiar with, um, with the, the levy system. Um, and then we are also working with DEP for, to expand this, this project further down to help offset some additional flooding. Uh, next. And then also kind of in the same area uh, of Renninger Park, you can see off to the right of the screen is, a, is the, the levee system. Um, we're working on uh, achieving, or we've already received grant money through the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and also Montgomery County um, for three projects uh, 
which would also help with the, the pollution reduction um, plan projects that we are required to do. And this one re, um, involves a uh, bioswale at the base of the, I think that's Parkside Lane um, and the tennis courts um, to help filter the water. Um, next. And here's just a, a general condition, as you can see in front of the, the car, there's some, some washout area. Um, and then this will help as the, as the water filters off the road um, help filter it better before it directly enters the creek. Next. Another project is uh, Glenside Library, which um, it has a lot of, uh, you know, parking lots and area. So this would be able to take some of the landscape islands that are already there, turn them into um, a rain garden, and also maybe create some uh, curb bump outs, rain gardens, along the, the dropout lane as well to filter the stormwater before it enters the creek, which as you can see us on the bottom right-hand side. Uh, next one. And here's some, some of the conditions. As you can see, there's, there is a grassy you know, area, but it, it's, not, it's very compact and it's not filtering stormwater. It's starting to degrade. Um, and also the long area in front of the library that would create some bump outs. Um, next. And this is, this is an example of what it might look like uh, when it's completed. Next. And then finally, we have Curtis Arboretum, another project that was part of the master plan. Up above the two ponds, there is a pipe that also collects stormwater before it enters the pipe, enter, enters the ponds. So we would daylight that pipe, um, create some kind of a meadow wetland area at the top in that kind of the bubble air, cloud area. Uh, and then, um, the stream bank where the pipe enters is eroded, so we would do some stream bank restoration work and some plantings to help filter the water. Uh, next. Hey, go. That's it for me. All right, Alice. Thank you, Allison. Um, so <clears throat> sort of to, I guess, recap some of the things that were shared there, you know, there's obviously we all benefit from an effective stormwater program in terms of uh, reduced local flooding and damage. Uh, we need to comply with the regulatory mandates, the MS4 permit requirements. Uh, as Mitch indicated, it, this can help protect property values and also improve the aesthetics of, of our local streams and waterways and improve their overall water quality and health. So, you know, when we talk about a stormwater utility, which is, a, you know, an entity, you know, focused just on stormwater with its own funding, why, why do we need them? Well, obviously we have the aging infrastructure that needs some uh, focused attention. Uh, we have increased uh, regulatory requirements. The, these pollutant reduction plans are a relatively new thing that the township didn't have to deal with, uh, you know, uh, years ago. We have, uh, you know, increased frequencies of flooding and flooding issues in, in, in our community. And, and really, we're starting to see this across the country that um, stormwater is finally starting to be recognized as a true utility, just like water and power and electricity and, and sanitary sewers or anything, that it has infrastructure, it has pipes, it has stuff that needs to be maintained and designed. And so we're really saying a stormwater utility, just like these other utilities, makes, makes sense to look at it that way. So in terms of how you fund a stormwater utility, you know, what is the benefit of a stormwater fee um, as opposed to funding through, through the, you know, the general fund as, as it would be today, the, the work that's getting done? Well, having a stormwater fee dedicates funding specifically to stormwater management. Uh, it allows a stable revenue for long-term planning and forecasting. So you know, I, I'm an engineer, so if I wanna plan projects, do condition assessments, and I, and I know, need to know what needs to be done for the system, well, it's hard to plan that and design and bid projects when you don't know what revenue you might have, if you're competing with other uh, needs out of a larger uh, uh, source of funds. So having a dedicated stormwater fee to only stormwater projects uh, has that benefit. And, and just to jump in, I, I think you can see from the list of projects, the regulated, the engineering is complicated. Um, there's structural and environmental issues. And so there's a lot that needs to go into each of the projects. And we have to meet certain criteria in each of those projects in order to, to be able to do them. So they don't have to be redone. And they are, they, they are meant to be long lasting. Go ahead, Tony, keep going. Thank you. So, you know, and when we look at stormwater fees, uh, it's also a, a fair distribution of costs to maintain the flooding controls and improve infrastructure. Uh, we know all, all developed properties and impervious surfaces create runoff, but, you know, currently under the 
tax funded uh, stormwater efforts, uh, tax exempt properties, nonprofits, things that have uh, sometimes significant impervious areas uh, may not uh, are not contributing into that that funding of stormwater management. So a fee is applied to all developed properties. So from that perspective is seen as a more equitable way to allocate the costs to the community uh, based on you know the relative impact on, on stormwater. And you know looking at uh, just the condition of infrastructure, it's really you know stormwater management you know needs to be a, a priority for the the township and and you know having the the cost funded through taxes is just a, a less efficient way to address it head on uh, going forward. Um, and you know this program is consistent with the I guess the the recommendations that came through from PFM and were adopted as part of the the financial strategies for the township uh, for the overall you know financial benefit of the township both short and long term. Mitch, did you have anything else to add on that? Are we good? <laughs> no, I think as we start to get, you know, we've laid out kind of like the case for the extent um, uh, and the commitment that needs to be made. I think, is, you know, we've laid out the fact that it has to be paid for and we want to try and, and now demonstrate um, that this commitment requires some measure of public support and a recognition by our residents that in, in order to get these things properly done for the long term to maintain quality of life, to minimize the impact of routine events, and to have some controls over um, those serious storm events. We have to do this. And I think we'll start to talk about what are our options, because we're not anywhere to, to you know, we need to, to say, yes, we're ready to make that decision. But we felt it, it was important to present the, the, the case for why we want to do it, for what it's meant to accomplish. And now I think we have to talk about some of the options for how to pay for it. Thank you. So, you know, storm air utilities, um, although relatively new to, to, to Pennsylvania have been around quite some time. And in uh, according, this is a, a Western Kentucky University survey that goes out annually. Uh, there's uh, at least 2000 storm utilities nationwide here now in 2020. And you can see they're they're all from east coast to west coast, west coast north to south. Uh, they're 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 all over the place. In in Pennsylvania, in particular, um, there was some enabling legislation that passed that allowed authorities and some uh, classes of townships to specifically uh, be authorized to create stormwater utilities back in 2013 and 14. And I think that helped uh, sort of trigger the 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 number of utilities that were being formed in Pennsylvania. And, and today there's probably about 47, at least that I'm, I'm aware of. There, there could very well be others that, um, that are out there that we don't even uh, know about in the state. So we're gonna to touch now on stormwater program and, and budget. So one of the first things we did, we sat down with the township, the township engineers and said, well, what, what is the work that's being done now on stormwater. You know, what what are we? What's the effort? And then we also talk about where should we be? What is what is some of the neglected or aging infrastructure that needs needs more attention as we as we go forward for a sustainable utility? And right now we're doing about cleaning 140 of storm inlets a year. Remember, there was I think uh, um, over 2,000 we said in the system, uh, repairing 16 of those inlets and replacing eight of them. In terms of pipe inspection, it's been very minimal and reactive. So in terms of putting a camera or looking down these pipes to assess their condition, if they need to be cleaned, it's only been when there's a collapse or a problem, something that is reactive in nature. Cleaning has been limited about 2,500 feet. If you recall, there's over 135,000 feet in the system. And pipe replacement has been about 100 feet a year. So it's less than a tenth of a percent of the system. So I think the point here is that we've done what we could to basically, if you'll forgive the, the, the use of the word, to put out the fires as they occur or put out the floods to get them under control as best we can in an urgent or emergency situation. And frankly, you know, there's that maintenance level. If we continue that, many of the people on this call and many of our 40,000 residents will, will continue to experience the issues of, of flooding and stormwater problems in their properties, unless we take on what is a, you know, an essential obligation. So 
Next right. point, Tim. Yep. And then about 300,000 on stormwater point repairs and uh, the system mapping and GIS, which is a geographical information system where we can look at the, the network of pipes, things in the computer system do doesn't exist. There's no GIS right now. And so that's something as we look forward as a target uh, service, we wanna um, increase the amount of cleaning and repairs to the system. Uh, on the line four there, initiate a proactive pipe inspection program, about 20,000 feet a year, so we can get in and start really understanding what is the condition of all these pipes, where do we need to focus our attention, increase the amount of cleaning we have, so we have fewer clogged pipes that can, you know, create localized flooding and intersections and whatnot, and then, um, you know, bump up the budget for pipe replacement, because we know as we get out there and start looking, we're going to find lots of problems. Uh, there's bound to be old corrugated metal pipe that's rusted through in places and needs attention. So, you know, that's increasing from 100 feet a year to 1400 feet a year, which is 1% of system. I mean, even at that rate, it would take 100 years to replace the whole system. But for, you know, it's a it's a great improvement from where we were and something that can be revisited over over time. So what this represents still is an enhanced level of maintenance, but it's not the mitigation and, and uh, longer term remediation of the, uh, these problems that will continue to plague us because it's still only a partial attention to a, to a system-wide problem, to a township-wide problem. Correct, correct. This is maintaining your existing infrastructure, basically. <laughs> um. I mentioned up here, here, I'm just sorry, on the right-hand side, you see a couple of these say, what's the what's the cost impact of this? You'll see there's some some increased costs that are identified here, 96,000, 12,000. Some of these say sea labor and equipment. So those are services that we think would be handled by the township internally, just through the cost, incremental cost of labor and equipment, as opposed to hiring like an outside contractor or something to do some repairs, which are what's shown here. So the, the labor and equipment aspect, currently there's a, about 11 and three quarters full-time equivalents, that's what FTE is, staff that support stormwater in some manner, whether it's field operations and crews or administrative staff that support the program. And looking at where we need, we would like to be going forward, we need to add about two and a half full-times equivalents to that. That's a two-person pipe inspection and cleaning crew and a half-time GIS technician that, you know, maybe support other functions of the township, but, you know, 50% funded out of the fee. Those result in about $193,000 a year cost uh, increment. And then uh, the township's in need of a new Vactor truck and a camera truck. And these are specialized pieces of equipment that allow the township to get in, inspect, and clean out the stormwater system to keep it functioning properly. And Tony, I think I saw the beginning of a, of a smile from Chris Kloel, who's the head of our public works department. <laughs> Looking at these things, realizing that after a lot of years of, of both urging and requesting some of these uh, these initiatives getting undertaken, that he's starting to see not just that we've taken it seriously, but we're looking at ways to get it accomplished. And Chris, thanks to you and your crew for all the work you do in what is a, at times a challenging and adverse environment when we get into those uh, those urgent situations. So we want to start to take those away from um, those being the routine and those should start to become more the exception. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so continuing with looking at level of service. So when we uh, look at uh, flood abatement projects, you know, in, in the re very recent years, there's, there's not been any projects. Street sweeping, uh, which impacts stormwater quality is done about six times a year and monthly in, in the business districts. Leaf collection, obviously we don't collect the leaves, they clog the inlets and impact uh, local flooding. Uh, it's done two rounds, uh, mid-October to December. And the existing uh, township BMPs, uh, stormwater ponds, things like that, are have not been, uh, I would say, proactively maintained. Uh, some Several have been installed, many more are planned to be installed as we go forward. And uh, there's not a, a, a main active maintenance program for those in place now uh, to, to where it needs to be to make sure they continue to function long term the way they were intended to and the way they were when they were first installed. Uh, and about one to two new projects a year from the pollutant reduction plan that are, are, are being implemented in the township. As we go forward uh, for flood abatement, there's some some big projects that were on the list that uh, uh, Allison and Mitch presented earlier that showed the Army Corps basins and the Glenside flood control additional project. Um, 
we have no proposed change in the street sweeping and leaf collection program. And then looking to start a proactive maintenance program for the, the best management practices that are in place now. There's some little catch up maintenance that needs to get done and, uh, and really to define that maintenance program. And then a steady amount annually that will actually uh, grow over time a bit each year uh, as those number of those assets uh, increases over time. And for the, uh, the, the, the pollutant reduction plan projects, uh, those are also ramping up uh, as scheduled in the uh, pollutant reduction plan uh, filed under the MS4 permit. So when we look at the capital projects, uh, the, new, the new projects, there's about 36 projects, uh, not counting that Army Corps and Glenside project that are identified to be implemented over the next 10 years. Although these don't have detailed designs and budgets associated with each, each one, the best estimate now is around $150,000 per project. That would result in about $5.4 million of projects over 10 years or $540,000 a year. When we look at the big, uh, the Army Corps and Glenside projects, there's, uh, those are gonna be debt funded. So there's an annual debt service payment that the township has to make for their portion of those costs, which is estimated at $225,000 a year. So when you add that to those other projects, it, it, it has a total annual capital stormwater budget of around $770,000 a year. So this is really our stake in the ground on the projects that, you know, collectively with Arcadis, with staff, looking at uh, commitments that already are made and looking at commitments that are, are really necessary. That puts us in a position to say, we've undertaken this initiative and it's, it's costing us that amount of money per year in order to be able to get this under uh, a degree of control that frankly is really critical. And, and again, it's not everything, but it starts to address many of the big problems, many of the chronic issues, many of the things that uh, quite a few of you on this call have experienced, you know, in both the routine and then in the serious uh, weather and flooding events that we need to find a way to get control of. And again, uh, the point here is these projects are township wide. There's not a single community that quote unquote suffers more than the other. All the communities are factored in here and all have serious issues that we're trying to address over this next 10 year period. And this is a fluid and dynamic um, situation. Sorry, to, that's a little, I didn't realize I said that. Um, the, the dynamic situation is that, it, that some of these projects may change. We may discover there's other um, issues or problems that come into play, but we've taken in this you know, early phase of this uh, uh, consulting effort, a look at what really is viewed as you know, necessary and essential. Thanks, Tony. So when we roll all that information together, the uh, things that are, the townships are spending money on right now with regards to stormwater, the street sweeping, the leaf collection, uh, the administrative efforts, the, all the operation maintenance activities, it's, it's around $1.7 million a year. That's in the, the 2020 column there. Now, when we look forward to 2022, uh, two years later, uh, obviously there's some inflationary type increases that would be budgeted in and, and some of the, the existing debt has a structure to it that it bumps up and, and costs a little bit on an annual basis. Uh, but we've looked at those improved level of service, that additional cleaning and, and, and operation and maintenance costs for pipe uh, repairs and replacements and those new capital projects, uh, adding about you know, one, $1. $1.4, $1.5 million a year to a total budget of uh, about $3.3 .3 million as shown in the right-hand column. And you'll see these little pie charts to show you that, you know, the incremental costs, really the, the new things that are going to get done, it's, it's about 53% is associated for new capital projects and, and the balance being on operation and maintenance related. When we look at the full budget that has all, including the existing activities, you, know, you see the, the leaf collection and the street sweeping and stuff, pieces of that pie show you there that, you know, O&M overall is about 51% and new capital projects about 24% of the overall budget. So what's important, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the area of transparency, we really wanted to quantify every dollar, every um, resource that is allocated currently or prospectively to stormwater management. So in, in incorporating the st street sweeping, leaf collection, you know, uh, and some of these other things, we basically were capturing every possible dollar 
in our in our line item uh, expense line items that that are allocated for this function, and that's one of the things we we felt it was important that everybody sees and recognizes that there's a current embedded cost, but there's all these incremental costs that we have to look at if we're going to undertake this and get it done um, in a way that gets the, the the issue under control to the degree that we believe is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. So, so that was sort of setting up the, what does the program look like and, and what is the, the budget for the program, both current and, and where we think it, it needs to be going forward. The next thing I touch on is like, how do we set an actual stormwater rate and how does that relate to, you know, imperviousness and what analyses we've done to, to support the, the evaluation. So a rate structure in general, you know, you want to keep it simple enough that people can understand it, but also equitable. So it's deemed as a fair way to allocate costs for stormwater management in the community. And when we look at residential properties, these would be like single family residential properties. The typical way that's done is one of two ways, either through a flat fee, or we just put them all in one group and they, everybody who's a single family residential property pays the same, or put them into some type of a tiered program where bigger properties pay more and smaller properties uh, pay less. Um, when we look at the non-residential and multifamily, uh, prop, uh, multifamily residential, be like an apartment building, um, and I, you'll sometimes hear me say commercial uh, for this group, although it's not truly just commercial properties, it includes other types of properties as well, but it's the non-residential. Those are typically done on exact amount of impervious area. And we've done that. We've measured for each of those, how much impervious area, how much parking lot, how much building, and, and their, their uh, fee would be directly proportional to that. And for properties that are undeveloped or in their natural state, they're still wooded and green, uh, they would not be charged a, a fee. And just as a, a data point, about two thirds of Pennsylvania stormwater utilities have a flat residential rate. So the way you calculate a raise, you take the overall stormwater program cost, that's that budget number you know, we looked at, and you divide it by the number of billing units, which is based on impervious area, and it uses a term called uh, the total equivalent residential units. So we, we tend to measure and account for imperviousness as how many typical residential units does that equal? So I'll explain that a little more in a few minutes. So we divide one number by the other and that creates required fee to fund the program. Uh, specific for residential, we did a parcel analysis where we looked at all the parcels in the township that were residential. And if you see the little red dots on here, that's actually all the individual parcels that were sampled because we want to make sure we spread them out throughout the township. It wasn't biased to one portion of the township or another. And it was also done on different lot sizes, you know, small, medium, large properties. About 462 parcels were done or 5% overall. And we also measured all the condos. Um, and condos are a little different because they have the, the actual dwelling unit that somebody owns. And then there's common spaces like parking areas associated with condos. And we, we make sure we account for that common area space when we, when we calculate condo average impervious areas as well. And when we do all that, the average amount of impervious surface per residential property in the township is 3,508 square feet. So we call that the equivalent residential unit. Uh, that's how much impervious a, and I, we have on average with the residences. Um, just so some of the digitizing, what it looks like, you can see on the one side, the little sort of yellowish polygons, that's the, in a residential area, it shows the buildings and the, the, the houses and the driveways. And then when we're in the, some of the non-residential might be a school or something, you can see the, the red areas there were um, digitized showing parking lots and buildings and things like that, that are uh, sidewalks that are considered to be um, impervious. So just just sort of uh, reinforces what I said earlier. So on a typical average residential unit here, we're looking at 3,508 square feet of impervious area. That's a combination of the building and the driveway that adds up to that amount. And when we look at non-residential multifamily properties, we calculate how many equivalent residential units do they equal? So in this example here, a, a property, hypothetical property here that had 34,700 square feet of impervious area, we divide that number by the ERU rate, that 3,508 average, and then we calculate a number. In this case, it's 9.89, or you might round it to 10 ERU. So this property, if we have a stormwater fee, would have a bill that's 10 times as much as a typical residential property because it has 10 times as much impervious surface. 
when we look throughout the township, there's a, a Obviously, um, there's a lot of single family residential properties and small commercial properties, but there's some bigger ones too, uh, entities. And you can see overall, there's 759 parcels of non-residential you know, uh, uh, properties. Uh, they amount to a total of 8,445 uh, gross equivalent residential units. Uh, we've assumed for rate calculation purposes that 15% of those credits would be lost to a credit program. So if we have a program where if you have a basin, a stormwater basin in your property, you can apply for a discount that we know we're gonna lose some of those billing units, if you will, to that program. The details of the program haven't been developed yet. So this is just a, uh, what we think is a relatively conservative estimate um, used for the basis of calculations. So you can just see on this table, some you know, the, the, the entities that have the most amount of impervious uh, area in the township. And then on the right hand property it says like how many parcels that is, is aggregated from that. So, you know, the school district at the, at the top, and then you can see throughout here the number of properties. And a number of these are, would be, um, you know, tax exempt properties that currently wouldn't be funding stormwater at all, but then would be receiving a stormwater bill if a fee is ultimately implemented. And Tony, to that point, at this stage, um, are real estate or residential taxpayers and commercial taxpayers right now, for those properties that are not tax rateables, that we, all of us, uh, are paying the impact that their stormwater runoff creates in our streams, in our streets, you know, on our, on our property. So part of, um, part of the thinking and part of the business um, uh, strategy behind this is to, to have some accountability on those parcels, on those properties that currently do not contribute to real estate taxes, but they contribute to stormwater problems and flooding. And we need to have some measure of accountability that comes in the form of this fee. And again, because these are um, accurately measured, we're going to be able to be very precise or specific about the, their impact in terms of their contribution. And the other thing, you know, as, as Tony laid out, we <clears throat> recognize that some people may have put in um, you know, rain basins or, or flood basins, et cetera. So there is a there is the opportunity for credits uh, to be available. And on the other side, we can give we may want to consider providing some incentives for those undertakings to be done by some of these um, property owners in order to to minimize the impact of the fees. But it's a six to one, half a dozen of the other. If you're not paying the fees, you're going to have to invest in order to get those credits. So in most cases, and I think Tony can support it, if they already don't have those um, flood and stormwater um, uh, mitigation programs and, and efforts in place, it's rare that they're going to spend the time and money to do those after the fact. Would that be correct, Tony? Yeah, I mean, for the, the various folks we've talked to over the years, yeah, if the payback period on an investment to build something new, uh, at least from an, a business uh, owner, is, I've said, you know, maybe three to five year, maybe seven year, so somewhere in the three to seven year payback period. Um, so in other words, if they have to do an upfront cash outlay, they want to save that money back and make it up within three to seven years. So, you know, typically most credits that are offered aren't going to provide that quick of a payback period. Like I, I've said before, I mean, Philadelphia has a unique program that's uh, part of their CSO combined sewer over long-term uh, elimination plan where they have a, a, a very generous credit and grant program uh, to incentivize private property owners to build things on their property voluntarily. And they've gotten a lot of participation, but it's a, it, it's, it's a, very unique and, and atypical program from what I've what I've seen out there, and, and costly. It's one of their, I think, it's their most expensive program they have in the <laughs> in the in the water department down there. So, um, so when we look at residential properties, there's ten thousand one hundred twelve residential single family residential properties. Now, if 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 the township went with a flat um, residential rate. So it's basically everybody's in one tier. There are no tiers. Everybody plays the same. Then that would result in 10,112 ERUs or billing units. That's pretty straightforward, right? One-to-one -one relationship. With the with the Stormwater Advisory Committee and the Executive Committee, we've been we've been we batted around a few options, and and 
a three-tier program was considered a, a viable option for implementing where smaller properties, in this case, less than one-tenth of an acre in size, would get a discount and only play a half of an ERU. And larger properties that are greater than a half acre in size would pay more, in this case, two ERUs. And the analysis here is kind of just showing in the, in the second column how many parcels we have in that, in that tier. So there's 1,310 parcels, less than a tenth of an acre in size. And that cohort or group has on average 1,696 uh, square feet of impervious area, which is about 50% of the ERU value, that 3,508. So that's why it, it, it would support the, uh, the basis of billing as only a half of an ERU. And you can see on the next two rows, when we have the groups of the condos, which factors in all that common space that are around the condos themselves, the parking lots and whatnot, um, coupled with the properties that are between a 10th and a half acre, um, they have an average impervious area that's really just right around the ERU. So it would be billed for one ERU. And then the bigger properties on average, you can see in the third row there have about 200% uh, uh, the average. So about double the amount of impervious area. Um, so, you know, this, this is uh, results in slightly more total ERUs. Um, it's, it's not quite as simple to explain and administer as a flat rate, but um, uh, the, the committees are thinking that this might be a slightly more equitable way to implement a stormwater fee in the community. Now, <clears throat> the, this slide shows, well, what would an actual rate or fee look like? So if you, if you considered uh, the stormwater fee on a quarterly basis. Now it may be billed on an annual basis, but uh, often we evaluate these things on a quarterly uh, basis for comparison purposes to other communities. Um, the full program that we identified, that $3.3 million, if that were to be entirely funded out of the stormwater fee, that would be around $55 a quarter per resident. If we looked at it just in terms of the incremental cost that we, we mentioned before, so not, not factoring all the existing street sweeping and leaf collection things that are already being done, that's around $25 a quarter. Uh, there hasn't been any decision yet um, on how this would be implemented. Uh, some of the considerations are as well, if the $25 is just representing the incremental cost beyond what we're already paying, uh, the, the sort of the argument, if you will, for including all things stormwater in there is it spreads the full cost of stormwater uh, amongst the entire community, including the tax exempt properties um, that currently aren't funding it at all uh, to the maximum extent. So again, this just shows the range of what that could look like um, for both the residential and then larger properties you see that have uh, equivalent resident, you know, impervious areas of five or 25 or a hundred times as much as a typical residential property. So how does that compare? Um, you know, within Pennsylvania, we indicated about 47 utilities spread throughout the state. And they have ranges of fees from anywhere from like six to $46 a quarter, uh, averages around 22. But there's, there's quite a, a variability in these in terms of what that fee is actually funding. Um, I know a few of these uh, personally that, you know, don't factor in everything that we talked about here, like the fully loaded program would, would account for. So um, it's not just that they're figuring out how to do it cheaper necessarily, it's that some of these aren't funding every, the full stormwater program out of that. Uh, Philadelphia is up in the upper 40s and uh, 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 I think Lemoyne Bor Borough is, is, is there in the highest, but that gives just a, a sort of a state of the where things are in Pennsylvania right now. And what's important about this slide, I think, is that we have to deal with our issues and our problems. We take, um, we take water in uh, from our neighboring municipalities, from Jenkintown, you know, Abington and Springfield. So we have to look at this from the standpoint of what we need to do in order to get this under control and be really um, the, the municipality that takes the responsibility seriously and invest to make, you know, these kinds of things not become regular and routine problems for the, the uh, balance of our residents. And, and I think it's important that we have to look at ourselves separately from some of the municipalities that don't have the aging infrastructure, that don't have um, nine square miles of space, that don't have ourselves surrounded by, by um, 
a couple of waterways that make it a much tougher thing to control. So I think it's important. The ranges are there because we wanted to present them, but we have to look at what's best to be able to get this matter under control, to do the necessary level of investment for Cheltenham. And you know, at the conclusion of this, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Why are we closer to the high end? And the truth is that that's what we have to do to get this under control, to get it managed, and to re really not have to deal with the kinds of incidents that in fact occur routinely. Many of us have been told there's a hundred year floodplain and most of us have had experience with the 100 year floodplain every five to 10 years. So this is a way to take that out of the, out of the um, both the quality of life and the expense equation uh, by doing the right level of investment over the next 10 years. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. So I just have a couple of quick slides here on the concept of credits. We've sort of touched on it, but um, Credits are a way to reduce your bill and they can encourage uh, private development of BMPs that will, will help uh, meet the MS4 permit requirements for, for new projects. Uh, it promotes equity by accounting for various levels of on-site stormwater management. So if you had two identical properties with the same amount of impervious surface and one was developed recently, so it, had to, it has on-site stormwater controls, it has a basin, it's being maintained, and another one's built decades ago and has no stormwater controls. Well, the one that had to invest that money in designing and building the stormwater controls and maintaining them can apply for a discount. So that, again, that seems it's usually received as a more equitable way of, of assessing the fee. Um, the stormwater uh, credit program would uh, likely be focused primarily on the non-residential multifamily parcels, but there may be uh, special circumstances where uh, single family residential properties could uh, participate in the credit program as well. Uh, O&M agreements, operation and maintenance agreements for those uh, uh, BMPs that are getting a credit and periodic inspection reports are likely gonna be required. And we may assess a review fee for credit applications, uh, then if they're actually approved would be uh, discounted off of a future bill. And really the details of the credit program are to be developed. We've just been talking some broad concepts and that's something I'll be working with the advisory committee uh, in the coming months to develop a, a more details on the credit program. Some types of things that generate credit are you know, structural things, BMPs. These are the rate and volume controls. They slow down the, the rate of which stormwater runs off a property or it captures it and allows it to infiltrate. Uh, there's certain non-structural ones where you don't need to build anything, but you maintain maybe a riparian buffer if you live along a stream area that, that's vegetated or um, in some cases, schools, education programs uh, can receive some credits for um, if they have an education, the curriculum, because that's one of the things uh, that uh, Allison mentioned as part of the uh, six minimum controls under the MS4 permit is doing some education in the community. So there's a benefit to that. And there's other institutional for property owners that have an MPDS industrial discharge permit, or if, if there's other entities within the township that actually have their own MS4 permit, typically they're offered a credit as well, recognizing that they're doing the same things we are. And the overall credit for a property is typically capped at 25 to 50%, meaning no matter how many little projects you do on your property, you, you can't reduce your bill to zero. Um, you do benefit from the overall community-wide stormwater system that functions, and allows you to drive down the street and everything else. So properties are, are also need to contribute to that uh, function as well. So with that, um, just a little bit more information, then we'd really like to start getting your feedback. Um, there's a website, the cheltenhamtownship.org under the hot topics, there's a stormwater matters button you can click where we got uh, some additional information we posted. Um, we're gonna have some additional meetings in the coming months to share more details on the program as it becomes available. And we're gonna be posting a frequently asked questions document to the website. It's not there today, but we'll be there in the, uh, in the future. We so, assume we'll get some more frequently asked questions tonight. <laughs> yes, yes. We've started drafting it, but we'll, we're going to incorporate the feedback we get from this meeting. So really at that point, I think, um, Allison, you might be going to help us uh, uh, open this up to questions, but we'd like to know a couple things specifically. If you think there are specific areas in the township where there's flooding and erosion problems that should make sure we're addressing as part of the future, 
Um, and then if the if there's areas where you think the condition of the stormwater infrastructure is is in need of, of desperate attention, make sure we're aware of those areas so they can be factored in. And then obviously any other questions you have about the program or what's been presented. Okay, if you have any questions, um, raise your hand or um, type your question in the chat box and we'll get to you. Um, I have uh, Ted and or Edie. Hello. The chat box. Hello. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that again? No, uh, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, I'm a residential property. Uh, I'm just wondering, I, I, I heard what you said about credits and such. Uh, I was just wondering if you have developed a rain guarding, uh, garden with uh, your runoff from your rain spouts and or uh, rain barrels, would that qualify you for any kind of credits uh, regarding what you would have to pay and what would the review process look like or don't we know that yet? Well, nothing's been decided def definitively on that. Um, the discussions so far have been leaning towards not uh, allowing credits for individual residential property rain barrels, just um, not that they're a bad thing by any means, but um, the uh, township's effort to sort of police and administer and check on those, it may not be justified, at least in the first phases of a credit program, um, because you know they do require uh, proper use and, and operation and whatnot. Permanent features on a residential property uh, that are more, um, you know, passively uh, operated. The, the, those could, those are still, I guess, under consideration. But the the general tendency right now has been to focus on the larger properties. Um, and unless there's, you have a large residential property that could, you know, maybe dedicate a portion of that to a, a significant project. But again, that's that's those decisions haven't been made, and we're, you know listening to your feedback and, and requests and suggestions uh, through this process. Okay, um, our next question, uh, Denise Feiner. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, am I understanding correctly that this would probably roughly cost each uh, resident single family resident, let's say a family residence would cost about a hundred to $125 a year. Well, that what we laid out was 25 to 55 a quarter. So that'd be a yeah, hundred to $220 a year, depending on, you know, whether it was just the incremental cost or the full freight of the program okay. issued as a fee. I just want to say that I think that's a very reasonable amount of money for any project that would contribute this much improvement to our township, I think it's very reasonable myself personally. Um, and I also just wanted to inquire, uh, I live right in the vicinity of, of uh, Burrow Road. I live up on Pikes Way. I'm curious what is actually being done right there on Tuckany Creek Parkway and Burrow Road. It was a very large project. And right at the corner of Tuckany and um, Jenkintown Road. There were two very large projects recently. Could you tell me what they were? What Is Chris, uh, uh, Chris or Mike Fleming on that could give us the detail on that? Just briefly. I'm not yeah. full scale engineering report. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Uh, so the answer to that question is uh, now over the last month or two, uh, the gas company was rerouting some pipes <clears throat> through the parkland and they had to do some boring to get under from one side to the other. That's why the one section was right at barrel there. There was like a, the big staging area. And then the other yeah. section was just west of Checking Town Road. As right. far as I know right now, I believe that project's pretty close, pretty close to completed. And yes. there's some restoration work to do, but that's what they were doing there at the time. Well, it looks great. And the people that were working there were very nice. Well, Denise, there's even another attribute to that uh, at the behest of um, some uh, some township staff commissioners. We aggressively uh, negotiated what originally was proposed at probably a fifty thousand um, dollar easement compensation. And I believe the final number that we received from Texas Eastern or will receive is in the neighborhood of four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. 
So because they were both impinging on township property and having a long-term, you know, underground project that had some issues. We wanted to make sure that there was adequate compensation. And so, um, good, you know, kudos to both township management and staff, as well as some of the commissioners who took a much more aggressive stance to be able to get that, uh, uh, those dollars into the township coffers. That's great, thank you. Um, our next question, Bonnie Hay. You're, um, Bonnie, you're probably on mute. There you go. Is it better? You can hear me now, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm a township resident. My husband and I have been here since 2005, and we were concerned about flooding issues and also about the amount of runoff that our property has. It's less than an acre, but it's a fairly um, large space. And so we converted a lot of our yard into um, shrubs and, you know, uh, native plants that are will suck up more water, but we also spent a fair amount of money to capture the runoff off our roof and to redirect it into a, a rain garden, which was costly to, um, to we, could, we had to have uh, it done professionally. And uh, we did it in, in hopes of helping to mitigate runoff in the township. Um, so I'm not too happy to hear that you're not really seriously considering the things that homeowners can do um, uh, to help mitigate runoff in our township. And I think that um, this committee should really be looking carefully at ways to incentivize um, doing more uh, by individual uh, homeowners. We have a lot of people that are interested in the environment. We have sustainability goals in our township. And um, I think you should do what you can do to um, incentivize this and to p take seriously mitigation efforts like we've done. Bonnie, I th this is Commissioner Zygmunt I, yes. I think that what we're doing now is listening to questions and concerns, issues that people are posing. Um, we did not say that was not a consideration. The rain barrel is a little less so, but if you've undertaken investment in, in mitigation efforts and to control stuff, control the flow. Um, it's something that will be taken into consideration. So both the, the, the internal team, the staff, as well as the stormwater advisory group in the next round of discussions will be taking your comments and other comments into account in order to try and make this uh, reflective of what is fair and equitable to people who have made investments to try and do the right thing already. So do not think that we have discounted it and that it's out of consideration, it's not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, our next uh, person is Rebecca Schultz. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, well, I, I really I really appreciate um, the, this whole presentation um, and, and the, the fact that this is being taken really seriously because with climate change it's only going to get worse so it's it's important to tackle now and i think the the rates are fair um and i agree with other folks who are talking about um uh mitigation measures on private property and you know and it doesn't necessarily need to be credits but education and incentives i think would be really really important because i think a lot of people with more education and maybe some small financial incentives would, would do these things on their properties. Um, but my question was um, how, I understand that the fee will be assessed to property owners, but there are a lot of people who live in this community who are not property owners and um, you know, property, property owners versus renters often fall along socioeconomic lines. And, even though they won't be assessed a fee, I think it's really important in terms of education and also, you know, just having the whole community kind of understand and have some ownership over, you know, these kinds of infrastructure projects. So are there plans to include renters and to do some real outreach to ensure that, that you know, the folks in the community that are really representative of the socioeconomic and racial demographics of, of the township 
um, have an opportunity to weigh in or hear about these plans. Well, I, I, I think what we're demonstrating here is a level of, of, you know, openness and transparency. So the truth is that, you know, renters or anybody had the right to participate tonight. We intend to do some very um, broad based kinds of communication through, the, through standard channels, through, the, um, through social media and, and that kind of thing. We're not going to launch anything or surprise people. And um, we're also going to talk uh, to some of the commercial uh, property owners, you know, for particular, say, in Linwood Gardens, et cetera, to let them understand what the impact and the implications are and, and insist that, they, you know, that they are being responsible to their tenants if, they're, if their intention is to, um, is to add that into, you know, the rentals and that kind of thing. So there is a recognition that it's not just, you know, um, the, the communication piece, but it's also the potential to have some discussions with property owners um, who are gonna be uh, impacted. And there's probably some things that we can ask of them in terms of the investments and credits in order to, to make sure that they're not simply passing it on to every tenant. Okay. Um, next question, uh, Michael Ambrose. Hi, good evening folks. Can you hear us? Yes. Yep. Great, great. I have two questions. One, um, is a twin a multifamily house or a residence? Um, I believe uh, we have duplexes as a single family residential category in the, in the analysis. Okay, thank you. Sec uh, second question, some driveway pavers, you know, they're, they're designed to let grass grow through them. Would they be considered an impervious surface or? Okay. So, um, well, for the residential properties, individual impervious areas are not going to be measured for every residential parcel. So the residential properties are going to put into a group one way or the other, either one group where they all pay the same regardless, uh, unless there's a credit program offered, um, or two, they're into a, a, a tiered system, which is just based on the size of your property, not the individual measured impervious area. And the reason for that isn't that it's you know a more equitable or fair way. It's that the administrative effort of trying to measure the exact impervious area on every single property and then adjust that every time it changes isn't worth the the benefit that you might get out of the increased equity out of that. So. I don't know if that answers your question. On your first question, I'm going to have to double check because if we have a, a, a twin or a duplex where it's two different tax parcels with two different property owners, I actually think that is actually both being counted as a residential property. So there would be two bills there. So I may have misspoken earlier, depending on what you're saying. If it's one legal property owner, one parcel, but it's split in half to be rented to two, that's, then it's one bill. But if it's actually two property, you know, legal properties that share, a, I guess, a commonwealth or a house, then, then that would be two, two bills. And depending on the In a tiered side, environment, wouldn't that represent potentially half of, of the, the, you know, the ERU? If, you, if, if, if they were the less, each of the half of the house, if you will, was on a property that's less than a tenth of an acre, and we went with a tiered system, then it would be in the half an ERU category, if that. Okay. Thank Allison, you. just to let you know, uh, Tom McHugh doesn't have the technical hand up, but he's raised his hand a couple of times. I know you have <laughs> other people queued up. Okay, well, let's go with him since I, I can't see him, um, and then I'll go with everyone else who has their hands raised. So, Tom McHugh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, trying to be constructive here. The, the uh, website's got a title that says a virtual public meeting on financing our future. And I think if you're trying to sell the fee as uh, something that will help to reduce stormwater damage and flooding, I don't think you want to as trying to sell it, promote it as financing our future. 
So it's just a thought there. Uh, the, the last thing you want residents to think is that it's going to go into the general fund and be used for everything to finance our future. All right, the next uh, point real quick was that one of the first slides had uh, potential future projects and the last three that were listed ended with the words high flow. One was Rock Creek and I forget what the other two were. Can I ask uh, whoever put the slideshow together, what do you exactly mean by high flow? And then I have one final question to ask. Allison, I don't know if you or if any, anybody on the call knows those projects uh, better than I do yeah. that could answer that. Um, I might have to defer to Chris Cool on that one. I think that might be a project sorry, he just, pointed out. That should be 22 or 21. Uh, one more. Here you go. The, these three on the left. High, vol high volume it was. Yeah, high yeah. volume. Yeah. Tookany Creek, Chelton Hills Drive, and Rock Lane. I just need to understand are you saying that there's high volume now and you want to better handle it or uh... no so well this is break them down one by one so rock lane between widener road and dell lane uh, several times in high water events big storms the waters overtaking the road there up into the houses uh, especially on rock lane crossing the park so we were just identifying that area as a high volume area, or I guess you could say a water destruction area in high water events. Shelton Hills Drive between Church and Hecock, there's uh, many times, as most residents know in the area, that road's been closed during high water events. The water does get up to the roadway about midway through Shelton Hills Drive there. So we consider that a high volume area. Turkey Creek Parkway between Burrell and Johns. Again, anybody down that side of the township would know there's floodgates that start right at Burrell Road. Uh, the water does crest uh, the flood wall very often, and even in a two and a half inch, two to the two and a half inch uh, fast uh, flash flood, it will cross the road right at uh, Klonite's Pond. It will continue down across the road go into Veterans Field all the way out to Central. Uh, I've seen it there four feet high on Tokyo Creek Parkway. That continues all the way down to Ashmead, Johns by uh, Melrose Country Club. So we were just identifying those potential areas as high volume. Uh, so people know, if you're not familiar with that area, where we have some of the bigger issues, uh, at least for overtaking the roadways and some properties. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, I was just trying to clarify that they're identifying problems uh, which occasionally flood, but not providing a solution. It's just something that needs to be looked at and decided upon as what well. It could be a solution upstream rather than just, um, you know, 20 years ago, the solution from the township manager was to dredge the creeks to make them deeper so they could hold <laughs> more water. Um, that never worked in Abington and Bader Run, and it never worked in Cheltenham. And of course, physics will tell you it would never work anywhere. Um, okay, so that that's good, Chris. Thank you. Um, okay. My 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 last question has to do with um, you know those charts that were it was went by a little too quick for me to write down everything, but generally what percentage of this fee will go towards the big projects or to help fund the big projects, the Army Corps, the Glenside, Glenside flood control projects uh, versus what percentage will go towards um, the maintenance, which maybe we're not spending enough on maintenance, but it's already in the general uh, budget. So let me uh, just get down to the, so the, Capital projects, though the, the two big projects, the Army Corps and Glenside, was about two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, the total of all those projects, which isn't just flooding, some of those are water quality, pollutant reduction projects, is the cost is about seven hundred seventy thousand dollars a year. When we look at the overall budget, these capital projects, the seven hundred ninety-three thousand dollars a year. 
that's about 24% of the total pie. If you look at the all in cost of the program, 3.3 million. If you look at just what's the incremental cost for spending. So if you, if you considered 2020 as a baseline, if you will, and only what we're adding to it, then those new capital products about 53% of the, the additional costs that we're looking at into the program. All right, thank you. And uh, my final comment, and then I'll get off, is um, you have to be careful not to oversell. Um, Mitch, I think that you, you might be a little too optimistic. We're still gonna get hit with 100 year, 250 year and 500 year storms, which are gonna overwhelm anything that we do, especially uh, street cleaning and localized repairs. Uh, the, the big thing we have to keep an eye on is, uh, you know, major flooding from major rain events uh, because uh, Abington is only making it worse and Jenkintown's not helping either. They're making it worse. And I, that's, that's the soapbox I always get on that we're, sure. we're, st we're stuck in the lower land and we're having to handle everybody's uh, storm water. And, and to that, and two co comments to that, um, having been in my home for 40 years, I've had eight episodes of flooding. Uh, so clearly I'm well beyond the hundred year flood plain. Um, but, but I think part of what we need to do is to demonstrate to our neighboring municipalities that we're taking this seriously and to start to push some of these issues, both county-wise and to the DEP to say, Cheltenham is now demonstrating a degree of accountability and responsibility for these things. And we need you, you know, instead of leaving us in the, the moratorium with the DEP, with, you know, with, the, with our um, EDUs, et cetera, we need to have them recognize that we've, we're taking on some of the challenges. Yes, we're gonna have in those serious rain events, it's gonna be impossible to control it. But so many of you know, the quote unquote routine storms create some of the same damage and flooding conditions. And those are the ones, Tom, that we're really focused on having a measure of control that right now we don't. So thank you for the comment and your, your sage input is, is continuing to, to be appreciated, you know, for the stormwater advisory group and everything that you do. So thanks. Back to you, Allison. Okay, our next um, question, Carmen Raitano. Okay, good evening. Hey. I want to uh, thank Arcadius, it's the best presentation on stormwater I've seen in over 53 years of stormwater design. Uh, Mitch, congratulations. I was really negative coming in to this meeting, but I am extremely happy that you're covering quite a few of the questions I would have had. My first comment is in addressing the previous speaker, the townships contributing to our flooding events should pay a price. As the residents of Cheltenham are going with this project to maintain the stormwater systems, prevent additional flooding and do what we can and pay for it, the same thing should apply to the contributing townships that are doing nothing. And as was discussed during the high flood events, all the townships upstream are contributing a great amount of flooding to Cheltenham. We can control the area and I enjoy hearing the equitable payment structure because that's the way to cover it without imposing a hardship on any one property owner. But it should also be the surrounding townships should do the same thing Philadelphia did years ago with the sanitary sewer system. We paid a price for other townships passing theirs through to Philadelphia and we get burdened by Philadelphia's structure. So as a recommendation, I think you guys are doing a great job. Arcadius and Tom Dell, it's wonderful, but I think we should be looking at one, getting the other townships involved and paying a piece of it because our system once it's in place, will help get rid of their flooding problems and back up. So why were we paying to help them out? They should contribute something. 
Carmen, it's, 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 it's a good suggestion, and, and let me make a comment. When we, okay. when we uh, did the Interceptor A project, uh, there was a contractual negotiation with both Jenkintown and, uh, and Abington to pick up a significant percentage of the costs. So if there is a, if there, we have the facility to do some of this, to, to negotiate and pa to pass some of this on, it's gonna take a little bit of legal aid work and structural engineering work. Uh, we'll certainly put that into the consideration set. I think both Tom and, and you have a, a, a good recommendation that we need to at least try and bring to our, our neighboring communities who contribute mightily to some of the problems in particular neighborhoods. Yes, thank you. And that's why I said earlier that I thought the township, the township commissioners at Arcadius have put together a very good program and also putting into place the follow-up to the MS4 that we tried years ago to get more uh, emphasis and inspection, inspections and get people, people motivated to participate like we had years ago. So, so Carmen, you, are you volunteering? You for the township. Are you volunteering to come out of retirement? I have on private <laughs> issues. <laughs> I spent I spent fifty three years yes, in stormwater design, <laughs> <laughs> including engineering of a power plant in Guatemala stormwater, <laughs> and working for the township. I did quite a few inspections, and especially during the flooding, so the residents that get hit by flooding are going to have it continually because nothing's changed to prevent those major flood events. And I'm glad to see we are doing it now. And I want to thank the current commissioners for that move. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, our next question, Emily Stein. Hi, I just wanted to bring up um, another area of flooding that I didn't hear mentioned um, that has stormwater problems and that's um, Wincote in the vicinity of the Jenkintown train station. Um, we pick up water right here coming down Greenwood Avenue from Church Road. Um, and then also water coming from Abington and Jenkintown, including Bader Run. And so I just like to hope that something in both Robinson Park on Greenwood Avenue and then Ralph Morgan Park right in and around um, Jenkintown station and Glenside Avenue and Cliff Terrace um, can be looked at at some point in the future. Um, that's really all I had to say, but we, I mean, we're also, we also get residents that are flooded in, in this area here too, in Wincoat. So. Emily, when, uh, when, uh, SEPTA came to us with the, uh, and the developers came to us with the idea of doing development at, at the train station there, one of the, um, matters that we imposed on the engineers, uh, was to do flood mitigation and stormwater remediation. So they're going to be in the, you know, whether or not they move forward with that plan, the fact is that uh, SEPTA is going to have some accountability and there's going to be some, we hope, uh, ability to uh, get uh, assessments or contributions in order to help to bring some of those matters under control. But thanks, I think yeah, that's on, on, constructive. On their property right now, the um, impervious surface goes right up to the edge of the creek. So any, I mean, out there today, there's piles of um, road salt spread in the parking lot and that just, you know, anything that's on the parking lot heads right into the creek without any sort of filtering um, the way things are now because they're, they are really paved right up to the edge. Noted, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, David Cohen. Thank you. In terms of two areas that were enlisted for um, some flooding, one is, from my observation, a moderate amount is the Mandel campus, especially near Ashburn Road. And more significantly would be the Woodland Little League fields, um, where during um, high rain events, those flood significantly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next question, David Coffin. David Goffin, you're on mute. Um, yeah, question I had was, uh, you mentioned the the Glenside uh, remediation projects. 
I'm assuming you're all, at least part of that's referring to what's in Grove Park. Uh, what's the status of that? I know it's been around for years, but it's kind of been very low key, certainly over the last few years. Allison, can you do an update? Anything on happening there? Is that the Army Corps project? Are they answering the question? Uh, I believe so, yes. The EP project. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an update on that, but we can provide you with one. I, I know that we yeah. had a presentation October a year ago, and the mm -hmm. discussion was my recollection, and this is just going to the memory banks, was like a a mid-year 2022 to 2024 undertaking. But I think what we can do is look into that and get back to you on that, David. Um, okay, that, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ann, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, just that was part of the original Army Corps project. And yeah, we have yet to hear from them in recent, uh, in the recent year. So uh, we keep asking for an update and to my knowledge, we really haven't gotten any. Um, should we Thanks. do something besides Okay, uh, Robert Hislop. Yes, uh, two things quickly. First, would you please consider naming this either a tax or a fee? because there are certain implications to personal income tax itemized deductions <clears throat> based on that naming. And the second, second is uh, probably something you're already gonna do, but since this is not a regular committee meeting, uh, is it a recorded meeting and up in a day or so, because even now we only have about 25 residents out of this group listening, and that's a very small percentage. So uh, for future meetings, uh, less repetition, if it can be shared as easily as a link. And thanks. Uh, yes, the meeting will be, uh, is re being recorded and will be posted on our website and social media. Um, next question, Don. You're on mute. There you go. All right. Thank you for taking my uh, question. I have. A, I just have a couple. I'm concerned about um, the uh, institutions of the nonprofits being thrown in uh, with gas stations and box stores. Um, I know. I know they have parking lots and stuff, but um, it doesn't tie in necessarily to the ability to pay. Uh, you can't pass on the. You can't raise the gas up or, or uh, sell more stuff just to uh, uh, make these fees. And these fees are pretty steep for the institutions uh, from what I can see. That's one of my, that's, that's one of my fears. The other one is um, how, come, how come for the institutions at least, I understand the flat fee for the houses, but for the institutions, uh, how come there wasn't like a percentage of, of um, impervious to the rest of the lot. Um, if, if three quarters of the lot is green and, and the building's only on one part and there's no uh, incentive to necessarily to cover it over, that they have to pay the same fee as if there's no grass around it. Um, so the, the fee, I, I, I think I understood what you're saying. The fee is, so if they, have a large property, but only a small building, if you will, or impervious area, they're right. only charged for the impervious, not, not the green space uh, right. that, that, that's around it. Now, if, if that green space were turned into parking lot, then, then the, the fee would, would, would go up. Um, there, the way, but the percentage of impervious isn't something um, that we've looked at, at using. It's the total area there are sometimes credits that can be developed for, you know, like I said, like if they're along a stream and maintain a riparian buffer 
or maybe some tree canopy credits if there's a large you know wooded portion of that lot that could be considered but that's typically how i've seen that kind of addressed if i if i'm understanding your question correctly yeah well what i'm concerned is about my own uh nonprofit church that i go to we're on several acres and and i agree we have a big parking lot and a and a, a fairly large building but we've got acres of open space it just seems like we would be taxed like a big box store uh, and not not enjoy at least the fact that we most of our ground is uh, uh, retaining water. I, it's a good comment. I mean, it's something we can can bring to this advisory committee. Uh, you know, if, if, if it's a small percentage, is that something that can be factored in somehow into the the credit yeah. the credit structure? Um, my my next question is real quick. Can we get can we get a copy of these slides? Because you, I just can't copy all this stuff, and I find some of it very interesting. Uh, the numbers and things. Is there any place that we can, like, copy yeah. up these slides? I, Alice, I think we we can make a PDF of this, and then you can put it on your website at the for for people to download. Is that? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would really appreciate that. It's okay. currently available You're on our website. In a, such a short period of time. Oh. It may be already there. <laughs> yeah, it's already on our website. Um, okay, if you go to, yes, yeah. If you go to our stormwater Manage matters page, um, I think you can find it under hot topics. Hot topics. Number of ways you can find it. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, obviously it wasn't up there when I did this screenshot, but uh, if you go to the Cheltenham Township.org, there's a uh, hot topics over here on the left, uh, right below about us, and then stormwater matters there. So hopefully you can find it there right now. Okay, we have another question for from Ted and Edie. Yes, uh, just wanna thank the commissioners and everyone else who is involved in addressing an, init an issue that has been going on for years and years. Um, I think it, it's good that we've started this discussion. I'm sure that there will be discussions on credits and such and whatever, but I just wanna thank uh, the commissioners for delving into this and also staff. Yeah. And this is great. I, I love the discussion and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're discussing this uh, to, uh, to quote Mr. Heislop, let's let's get this going and 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 get it get it resolved. Thank you. Thanks, Ted Needy. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Tom McHugh. Uh, just a real quick comment. Uh, there ought to be for Tony to consider a differentiation between grass, meadow and forested areas. Um, I'm, as Tony knows, the trees are the best way to do stormwater management. Meadows, not quite as good, and grass is not much better than asphalt. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just something to think about when you get into a, a, how you count and how you determine the fees. We want to encourage people to have as many trees as possible, and we want to discourage things like my my real ne nemesis or pet peeve is the uh, overflow parking at Target. It's insane. It's just, it, it's right along Rock Creek and there's never, ever been a car parked in there. Okay. Thank you. Good, good comment. Um, I, I'll, I'll say um, tree canopy I've seen is something that if, if that can be assessed or applied as a credit, um, there is a sort of just a logistical challenge of trying to refine the the measurement of surfaces and accounting of that, um, where just for practical reasons, not so much for you know, not against the reasons you said. It, it, sometimes that's hard to account for. You know, what one type of green surface versus another green surface might be, and and how we measure that. So, it's a good comment and something we will consider. Is that it, Allison? Uh, last chance. I'm not seeing any more comments. Well, you know, just on behalf of the board, the staff, Arcadis, 
uh, the members of the Stormwater Advisory Group, we greatly appreciate um, your participation, the question and feedback. We expect that there's much more that you're going to be able to bring to the table to help us make the right kinds of decisions um, and come to some conclusions that are going to be helpful in terms of mitigating the routine storm situations that come up and have some ability to at least slow down or minimize some of the impacts on those big storms. But I think what we want to do is move to the next phase, <coughs> excuse me, and continue to get us closer to the place where we're going to be able to address uh, virtually all the issues um, on the routine and, and make sure that we have a long-term vision and a long-term strategy for managing the things that are within our control. So thank you all. It, this is, again, it's a continuing process and we hope, um, we hope we'll have another opportunity in, you know, within the next, say, four to six weeks to have another session and we'll have made some progress and hopefully taken some more input to get us to a, even a better next step. So thank you all. Thank you. And thank you. We'll keep everyone posted. We have email addresses through the registration process. So when we have our uh, next meeting, we'll send an email out to, to everyone who's attended as well as through our social media and email contacts. So thank you. Thank you and good night.